We're in a race against the Nazis. And I know what it means if the Nazis have a bomb. Imagine you are someone who lives on July 16, 1945. The world is still engulfed in the shadows of World War II. What if I told you that humanity will soon possess the power to erase its own existence with the press of a button? You might think it's the plot of a science fiction book, but fast forward a few decades and this becomes the chilling reality of nuclear weapons. Enter J. Robert Oppenheimer, a man whose genius was as radiant and formidable as the blasts his creation unleashed. A tormented soul, wrapped in the enigmatic tapestry of quantum mechanics and the titanic weight of human life. A complex mind that stood at the precipice of innovation and annihilation. His relentless pursuit led to the nightmarish birth of the atomic bomb, a tool so monumentally destructive that it possessed the fury to not only reshape the land, but also to forever cast its shadow over the political landscape of the globe. As he beheld his creation's earth-shattering might, he quoted ancient scripture, capturing the gravity of the formidable firestorm he had unleashed upon the world. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Now, let us venture into the abyss, into the haunting shadow cast by these world-shattering weapons, and bear witness to the legacy of a man caught between the boundless realms of science and the harrowing precipices of moral conscience. The legacy of J. Robert Oppenheimer and the existential risk of nuclear weapons. Think back to the 1930s, where for the first time we make some breakthroughs in nuclear physics, some genius figures out that it's possible to create a nuclear chain reaction and then realizes that this could lead to the bomb. And we do some more work. It turns out that what you require to make a nuclear bomb is highly enriched uranium or plutonium, which are very, very difficult materials to get. You need ultra centrifuges, you need reactors, like massive amounts of energy. But suppose it had turned out instead that there had been an easy way to unlock the energy of the atom. And that maybe, you know, by baking sand in the microwave oven or something like that, you could have created a nuclear detonation. But now we know that that's physically impossible, right? But before you did the relevant physics, how could you have known how it would turn out? The storm unleashed by Oppenheimer and his compatriots in the Manhattan Project cast a tempest of existential dread across the ages. Nuclear weapons conceived in laboratories embody the power to snuff out civilizations in a blink. As papers rustled and chalkboards filled with frenzied calculations, the magnitude of this creation began to dawn upon the scientists involved. Oppenheimer, a brooding Prometheus, was central to the Manhattan Project, an unprecedented crucible of science, ambition, and secrecy that birthed the atomic bomb. But within the cloistered halls, whispers of apprehension swirled. Some physicists' brows furrowed with dread over an unthinkable possibility. Could the bomb ignite Earth's atmosphere and condemn our planet to a fiery apocalypse? Their concerns were born from the very core of the unknown. Before the Manhattan Project, the world was blind to how daunting or terrifyingly, how feasible it was to harness the cataclysmic forces within the atom. As they raced against time, battling both their haunting fears and the pulse of a world at war, a Pandora's box of unfathomable power was being pried open. These architects of Armageddon stood on a precipice, torn between the quest for ending a war and the horror of birthing an era where the very survival of humanity teetered on a razor's edge. The world would never be the same. So think about what that would have meant if, say, anybody, by working in their kitchen for an afternoon, could destroy a city. It's hard to see how modern civilization as we know it could have survived that. Because in any population of a million people, there will always be some who would, for whatever reason, choose to use that destructive power. If that apocalyptic residual would choose to destroy a city or worse, then cities would get destroyed. In addition to these kind of obvious types of black balls that would just make it possible to blow up a lot of things, other types would act by creating bad incentives for humans to do things that are harmful. So to think about some technology that incentivizes great powers to use their massive amounts of force to create destructions. I mean, so nuclear weapons were actually very close to it. What we did, we spent over $10 trillion to build 70,000 nuclear warheads and put them on hair trigger alert. And there were several times during the Cold War where we almost blew each other up. It's not because a lot of people felt this would be a great idea, let's all spend $10 trillion to blow ourselves up, but the incentives were such. Imagine if there had been a safe first strike, then it might have been very tricky in a crisis situation to refrain 
from launching all their nuclear missiles, if nothing else, because he would fear that the other side might do it. J. Robert Oppenheimer, though a central figure, was just one among many in the Manhattan Project. His journey from physicist to the father of the atomic bomb was laden with both scientific breakthroughs and ethical dilemmas. Fast forward to 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis, a moment when the Cold War was about to be turned red hot. The Soviet Union was constructing missile bases in Cuba. In response, the United States enacted a naval blockade around the island. For 13 tense days, the world stood on the brink as both superpowers, armed with nuclear weapons, faced each other. This was the closest the world has ever come to a full-scale nuclear war. Through tense negotiations and the commitment of both sides to avoid annihilation, disaster was averted. However, had the missiles been launched, the concept of a nuclear winter becomes relevant. Scientifically, a nuclear winter is a theoretical scenario where widespread firestorms from nuclear explosions would thrust soot into the stratosphere. This could block out sunlight, drastically lowering temperatures across the globe. Crop failure and famine would follow, potentially endangering all of humanity. Now let's bring our focus to the present day. The threat posed by nuclear weapons is more salient than ever. In February 2022, tensions soared when Russia invaded Ukraine. With Russia being a nuclear-armed state, the world was reminded of the catastrophic consequences that can ensue if conflicts escalate uncontrollably. It is imperative to understand the gravity of nuclear weaponry. The yield of modern nuclear weapons can be over a thousand times more powerful than the bombs dropped in 1945. The destructive potential is immense, and the long-term consequences for the global climate and ecosystems are dire. In an age of complex international relations and multifaceted geopolitical interests, the lessons of history and the stark scientific realities of nuclear weapons must guide our actions to ensure the safety and survival of humanity. It's extremely frightening. It's almost Freudian. It's the return of the repressed. We thought that, oh, nuclear weapons, yes, there was something about that in the 1960s with the Cuban Missile Crisis and Dr. Strangelove. But no, it's here. And, you know, it took just a few days of difficulties on the battlefield for suddenly, and you have these experts explaining to people what different nuclear weapons will do to this city or to this country. It rushed back in. So, you know, nuclear weapons are, in a way, they also, until now, preserve the peace of the world. I belong to the school of thought that if it was not for nuclear weapons, we would have had the Third World War between the Soviet Union and the United States sometime in the 1950s or 60s. Nuclear weapons actually, until today, served a good function. It's because of nuclear weapons that we did not have any more cl direct clashes between superpowers because it was obvious that this would be collective suicide. But the danger is still there, is always there. If there is a miscalculation, then the results could of course be existential, catastrophic. The doomsday argument is this. It's an argument that we have systematically underestimated the probability that humanity will go extinct soon. Now, I should say most people probably think at the end of the day there is something wrong with this doomsday argument that it doesn't really hold. It's like there's something wrong with it, but it's proved hard to say exactly what is wrong with it. Imagine you have two urns in front of you and they have balls in them that have numbers. The two urns look the same, but inside one there are 10 balls. Ball number one, two, three, up to ball number 10. And then in the other urn, you have a million balls numbered one, to a million. Somebody puts one of these urns in front of you and asks you to guess what's the chance it's the 10 ball urn. And you say, well, 50 50. They, you know, I can't tell which urn it is. But then you're allowed to reach in and pick a ball at random from the urn. And let's suppose you find that it's ball number seven. So that's strong evidence for the 10 ball hypothesis. The doomsday argument says that you should reason in a similar way with respect to different hypotheses about how many how many balls there will be in the urn of humanity by the time we go extinct. So to simplify, let's suppose we only consider two hypotheses, either maybe 200 billion humans in total or 200 trillion humans in total. So you start with some prior based on ordinary empirical ideas about threats to civilization and so forth. And maybe you say it's a 5% chance that we will go extinct by the time there will have been 200 billion only. You're kind of optimistic, let's say. Probably we'll make it through, colonize the universe. But then 
according to this doomsday argument, you should take off your own birth rank of all humans that have ever existed. Turns out you're about human number 100 billion. That's like roughly how many people have been born before you. If there are only going to be 200 billion in total, that's a perfectly unremarkable number. You're somewhere in the middle. Now, if they're going to be 200 trillion, you would be remarkably early. What are the chances out of these 200 trillion humans that you should be human number 100 billion? That seems it would have a much lower conditional probability. And so analogously to how in the urn case, you thought after finding this low numbered random sample, you update it in favor of the urn having few balls. Similarly, in this case, you should update in favor of the human species having a lower total number that is doomed soon by the time we go extinct. As the echoes of Oppenheimer's tormented genius reverberate through time, we stand at a crossroads where the brilliance of human innovation casts shadows that can consume us. The atomic forces unleashed by that fateful project continue to loom like titans over our world. It is upon us to recognize the double-edged sword of our creations. Nuclear weapons, mighty as they are, bestow upon humanity a responsibility of cosmic proportions. May we wield this power with the solemn wisdom that the fabric of life is fragile and precious. Let us forge a legacy that illuminates the ages, not with the blinding light of destruction, but with the enduring flame of hope, understanding and guardianship over this pale blue dot we call home.